Thank you all very much for your excellent testimony. I suspect the commissioners have uh, many questions for you. And uh, I think we want to begin with Commissioners McGeehan and Patrick, who I know had questions at the, the last time we had a round of questioning. Commissioner McGeehan. Uh, thank you. Actually, I have, I have six questions, so just sort of a, a, <laughs> a <laughs> housekeeping. Should, I, should we kind of break it up a little bit to give everybody a chance? or? Uh, okay, I think okay. Go for it. Okay. <laughs> I think that's, I think that's probably right. the best way to do okay, it. Okay, okay. Are these six questions directed at a particular no, supervisor? No, okay, no, Okay, so as long as there's no cruel and unusual you know, punishment. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, one, one theme I heard from several of you, and I thank you for your excellent testimony. It was really interesting to, to hear it, um, was a common theme regarding vendor accountability for voting systems, for electronic poll books, um, printing of ballots. Um, and I was curious about that because I know Florida has one of the most rigorous voting system certification programs. Um, so I wanted to see recommendations on how that program could be improved. Um, curious how you interact with the federal process, the EAC and the uh, voluntary voting system standards. And then also curious if you'd like to what are your thoughts about extending certification to um, online poll books, printing, uh, ballot printing, is, should that be a state level function or what your thoughts are on that? And whoever wants to address that, I know several of you. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, our county experienced a, a severe software failure that was not caught in the certification. And so in my opinion, I believe that we, it's time to enhance the minimum standards that were established in 2005. Um, there's really hasn't been until this legislation was passed about a month and a half ago any accountability should there be a failure. I recognize that you cannot test and certify for every scenario, but it's found it very interesting that the vendor knew about the problem and did not disclose that issue. And after the failure, there was no repercussion. And when we upgraded our software, we again found two anomalies that were not caught in testing and certification and were not disclosed by the vendor. So I think that the legislation that we found out of the state of California that was passed in Florida will go a long way, but it might be something that we consider nationally. Thank you. Let me follow up on the other part of the question. And I used to be on the standards board and the board of advisors for the EAC. And that question was raised about do we go beyond the tabulation systems in terms of certification. Uh, and my, my hope is that that doesn't happen. Uh, here in the state of Florida, we have 62 counties that use one vendor uh, for their voter registration system. And so they're tied to that vendor when it comes to er, uh, electronic poll books and all this, so they have to use that vendor. Uh, Orange County happens to be an independent uh, design voter registration system and it works with the state. It's in unison with the statewide database. But we were able to take and go out and use off-the-shelf products to create a electronic poll book and was able to do it for $900 a unit uh, compared to what the vendor for the other 62 counties uh, were offering at the time about $3,500 for their units. So I think some of the independence, and again, the key question is, is it on tabulation that we're concerned with, or is it all the components down the line? I'd say any failure in the, in the in, inline process is a failure that will show up at some point in time. Um, if you don't disclose early or realize it early, you will experience it at a timeline on election day there's, there's no activity that you can do other than mitigate what's taken place and ensure that the voters' rights are protected. But at that point, if the equipment is failing and you have no backup, there's no process, um, poll books right now, you have a separate entity piece attachment to do a battery backup. It's not standard to have a battery backup in it already in some versus others. Wouldn't that be a minimum requirement uh, of a poll book? In my, my opinion, it would be. But again, who's going to drive that and push, encourage the vendors to move in that direction? And yeah, that was my, my question to you all too, to see if that's, uh, 
but what I guess what I'm hearing is that since the since the poll books have to interface with the voting system, that maybe it could be connected all to that voting system certification process, or maybe I didn't understand your. Well, and and if I could chime in to Commissioner McGeehan, they. Um, as it relates to federal standards, the, the, the VVSG, the, the, the National Testing Labs versus Florida certification process, and I'm fortunate to, over the years, have been asked to work very closely with the Bureau of Voting System certification in Tallahassee. It, um, Florida, because it has its own rigorous standards, um, does not necessarily put a whole lot of, uh, you know, you don't have to go through the federal certification before you bring your product to Florida necessarily. Uh, because we're going to put it through uh, every bit as tough of a meat grinder as as the national standards are. But as anyone who's been involved with the VVSG knows, um, we're only about 10 years behind on where the VVSG is for the technology. And Florida certification standards, unfortunately, are, are equally as behind and, and currently being looked at for review. But, um, of course, with, you know, the EAC and the lack of commissioners, uh, hands are tied in a lot of capacities as it comes to moving forward with some of those issues. Okay. All right, I'll move on. Thank you for that. Uh, those responses. Um, I'm going to streamline a little bit. Um, on voter education, um, Supervisor Snipes, you had mentioned that that was something that you all um, have a budget for, and I was curious, is that your county funds, or does the state contribute? And is there any statewide standards on voter education, or is it just each county sets its own standards? Um, I don't think there's any um, standard. I'm not sure if there are standards statewide, but I think a lot depends upon what the characteristics are of your county. In Broward, being a very large and very diverse county, uh, we feel the need to get as much information out to voters as we possibly can. So we do budget some of that outreach money through our uh, county funds, but we also use HAVA dollars as well. As a matter of fact, the sample ballot that we produce is funded pretty much in part by HAVA dollars. All right. Okay. Um, I was also really curious. I thought I heard you said that uh, say that the your public schools close on election day so that you can use the schools. So. That has been a real um, boon to us. I think maybe about four years ago when we went into a higher level security procedures in the schools, we were able to negotiate with the um, school administration district wide, as well as the teachers union to have schools close to students on election day. So that gave us full reign of the schools in terms of the facility itself, in terms of the parking facilities. There was not a large concern about security, but I think the biggest outcome of that has been that students are able to actually work on election day. So that's been, that's been a tremendous gain for us. Well, that's very interesting. That's a has not spread into the other counties. We don't have the same agreements with our school systems or our teachers union. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm from Texas and I was really floored to hear you were able to do that with your local <laughs> school district that they would close, but that, that's great. Um, let's see. I was, uh, let's see. Um, Commissioner Townsley, you had mentioned you had a voter <clears throat> protection program for the elderly. I was curious about that. Uh, yes, we we were very fortunate to be able to uh, implement a supervised voting program um, uh, last year, and uh, we currently are partnering with the one of the associations of assisted living facilities, and so we currently have about fifty six um, facilities that are engaged in the program what we do is we first go in and we offer training to the facility administrators administrators and their staffs and then we we come back during the election period and we uh, administer elections to their their eligible residents so your count your county staff goes to the assisted living centers to help assist the voters and okay. correct 
Um, and, and Commissioner, that's actually state law. Um, all oh, the supervisors okay. do provide some form of assisted voting uh, under the current statute. Um, and then my last question, uh, I'll turn it over. Um, it's another question for you, uh, Supervisor Townsley. You uh, mentioned you're about to look at re-precincting, and I was curious what kind of, uh, if you have any criteria, like a minimum number of, of registered voters per polling place, or what kind of criteria you're going to look to to re-precinct. Yes, we have uh, established criteria for re-precincting. Um, our, our base number for uh, is 2,500 registered voters per precinct and polling place. Is that state law or is that your own local determination? That's our internal standard. Okay. I think a piggyback to that is that we don't have a state law, but when you set the number, Remember that you're then subtracting from it the number who are absentee voting, the number who have a history of early voting, and then you got the percentage who don't show up. So when you're looking at assigning them to a polling place, that's just the number for dividing up the population, but it doesn't reflect the voting trend. Right, yes. I would also contend that if you have a large gymnasium, that the volume would affect the numbers and performance. Right, good point. Okay, thank you so much. Well, I also have a long list, which I'm sure surprises all of you. Um, and thank you all for being here today. It's always a pleasure to see so many um, faces that I know. I tried to kind of group these together and to segue um, on uh, an earlier question about some of the accommodations for voters with disabilities. Um, Supervisor Cowley, you had mentioned briefly an electronic solution that you had for, um, for voters, and I was curious if you could elaborate on that just a little bit. Uh, thank you, and uh, when we first uh, made sure that in our law that we could do the electronic transmission of, of ballots uh, to voters overseas, we talked to the Department of State and asked if could it also be done for voters with a disability? And the answer was that, is it just a delivery system? And so they would still have to, they could use their own apparatuses at home to vote it, but they would then have to print out the ballot and mail it back. And so uh, we began to use it as that. We uh, also had made the decision for the voters with disability, we would also send them uh, a hard copy, uh, regular absentee ballot so that if they had problems with their electronic one, they had a paper ballot. And also the system that we were using also says you can print out the envelope, cut, paste, and put it together, and we knew they couldn't, did not want to do that. So uh, we sent them so they would have the envelopes. And uh, actually I have one voter who told me he was adamant, I want to be seen on election day at the polls. And I said, well, just give it one try called me back and says I'll never go to the polls again, this was great. <laughs> Thank you, that's very interesting. And I like the, um, one, the idea that then the voter is using the technology that they already have, that they're comfortable with, that they're familiar with. It's not something that is only used in voting and that they never see anywhere else, because I think that can be a real challenge for many of us. Um, the two other questions that I had and they're in, in very general kind of areas is, Thank you, by the way, for the ballot. We, of course, had all heard and seen pictures, but just having it in your hands is quite astounding. Um, and my question is, is really related to this because there are certainly questions to be raised. Um, I know in our own jurisdiction, for a general election, we are able to have the minority language ballots in their own languages. And that was something that our voters truly wanted and asked for. So in all elections, jurisdictional elections, school district elections, the ballots like this, it's a one page bilingual ballot with all the languages on it because we're able to do it on a single page. Um, in 2006, we did the general election like this and it drove it to multiple pages and our voters had an uproar about it. So we were able to pre-clear back in the old days of, of those things, um, getting it back to two different languages. And our voters really appreciated that. So I'm curious if you hear from the minority language community that that's what they would prefer or not prefer. Because there's certainly um, the uh, argument that having English and the minority language together is helpful to some voters. So I'm just curious if you had any kind of pushback from within the minority language communities, just as a whole. 
think post-election in the review of the 2012 election, a lot of people questioned why we had bilingual or trilingual ballots. And so uh, I think it goes back, uh, and that came from the evaluation of how the elections work and the ballots could be shorter. But from an election administration standpoint, as you well know, is that when you're talking about poll workers having ballot styles and having to issue ballots, you, you now create more different ballot styles, which puts pressure on the poll workers to ask the question, which language, and then pull. Mm -hmm. You also have the risk of sending the wrong language in the absentee and then hearing from the voter mm -hmm. for the wrong one. Uh, many of us on this panel uh, participated in the joint election officials liaison conference in D.C. in January. Department of Justice again said we recommend and prefer right. bilingual or trilingual ballots. Uh, they then, then made a presentation at an election center conference in New Orleans and they repeated the same message. But uh, in our state, they did put into our new legislation that we could petition the Department of Justice to do separate language separate language ballots. So that was something that the Florida legislature put in that we could petition but did not demand that it be separate. All right, and then my last question had to do with um, the post office has come up periodically. Um, and there are a couple of questions I had about that. One was for Supervisor Snipes. You mentioned that um, things were going to Opelaka instead of to Fort Lauderdale. Was Fort Lauderdale closed in part of the, the consolidations of the polling facility or the postal p facilities in Florida? Or was they were routed incorrectly? Or what, what exactly was the issue there? The Fort Lauderdale pro um, post office no longer processed flats. Okay. They had processed the flats up until this year. And uh, we don't know if trucking the ballots to Opelika had an effect or not. Uh, we did receive the assistance from the post office to begin some kind of a research procedure to determine exactly what happened. We've never been able to finalize the outcome of their research, but the post office did change its procedure in terms of our being able to have our ballots processed at the local post office. So uh, we take them there for receiving them so that we do have a record that we turn them over to a post office. However, they uh, were trucked from there, oh, I don't know, 35, 40 miles away to actually be processed. And I don't know if that resulted in some of the uh, ballots not being received by voters at all and some being received uh, extremely late. Thank you. And, and so many of you mentioned voters not getting their ballots. And if you, did you feel that it was um, a higher proportion of the voters, maybe a higher volume because you have more yes. voters voting by mail, but was it a higher proportion? Um, did you think, was there, I'm, I'm curious because in dealings with the post office, um, particularly with the advocacy on their part to go to a five day, I've had a long, ex you know, extensive conversations about the impact this will have on the many jurisdictions that vote by mail and have tried to emphasize to the post office that for many of our voters, that blue post office box is their ballot box. Mm -hmm. And if they're being processed and then shipped off to be processed and then back again, that time frame is going to be very impactful for states like Florida where there's no postmark that can be utilized in the processing of the ballot or determining the eligibility. Well, I believe that because of the large influx in a presidential election, along with all of the campaign mail mm -hmm. and then along with just regular mail, I think they were overwhelmed. We contacted the Postmaster General. We contacted our senator, we contacted Congress, and we really didn't get any answers. We wrote a lo numerous letters, we followed up after the election, and the regional manager for the southeast region of Florida has not responded properly. And so I would appreciate any kind of emphasis that you might be able as a, a committee to place on the U.S. Postal Service. It's an injustice. We mailed not only one ballot, but two ballots yeah. and sometimes three and spoke directly to the carriers, mm -hmm. they weren't getting them. We don't know why, but we are required by January 2014 to implement something called the IMB code, and that <coughs> will allow us to track each individual ballot at a cost. The cost is worth it. 
I agree with you. I think the cost will be worth it, particularly when you're mailing out multiple ballots of this volume. The cost is just unbelievable. So thank if you all. I could, if I could also make a comment on that, we not only mailed out one, two, and three ballots, but in some instances when the voters still did not receive the ballot, we put couriers on the road to actually hand deliver those ballots. So I think elections professionals probably made took every opportunity they could to get a ballot in the hands of the voter. But this is something that's certainly outside of our realm of influence in terms of being able to sit down and negotiate with the um, post office representatives. And I know there are uh, many changes underway, but if the absentee ballot is going to remain and grow as a significant tool for voters who want to exercise their option to vote, I think we've got to know that that ballot can take a path to go to the voter and be able to return to us so they can be timely processed. If, if I may chime in one, <laughs> one more comment uh, with regard to that, that I did not push vote by mail in my county. I pushed early voting and precinct voting. And the reason I did that was because our mail leaves our location and goes to Pensacola to be sorted and processed which is two hours away, and then comes back usually to be sent to the voter. So knowing that and that when that was occurring, I used that as a tool to say, we want to use, we want to get you an absentee and we'll do vote by mail. But if you can go an early vote, go an early vote. And I think it also helped us survive this last election in the process. So just as a thought. Madam Commissioner, uh, I am having a meeting. <coughs> in July with the regional director of the U.S. Post Office, and uh, we are talking about uh, participating with supervisors and a task force to strategically plan not only in Florida but regionally and would recommend as we get closer to an election cycle a year or two in advance that a special group of the U.S. Postal Service work with supervisors and state election officials to look at potential demand. This is a resource issue, and if they know what's coming to them, they should be able to handle and manage what comes back to us. So I commend the U.S. Postal Service for stepping up. Uh, they are participating with us in conversation, and I think that uh, we're going to go a long way to having a plan next time here in Florida. Um, and, and I just wanted to chime in to, um, number one, they're not all horror stories, thank goodness. Um, now, I'm fortunate because I, I'm less than 40 minutes from Pensacola. Um, so as a mail processing, that's all going to go faster anyway. But my postmaster from Crestview, um, he actually drove over on election night in his own vehicle to pick up any ballots that might be hanging around the post office that otherwise would not have been delivered. Um, so there are certain postal uh, officials who are doing a lot to go above and beyond uh, what they need to do. But as it relates to overseas voters, um, the U.S. Postal Service has that express seven-day delivery. Uh, and Scott Wiedemann from the Federal Voting Assistance Program was just in my office this past Monday, and we were reviewing some of these envelopes with him, and we discovered that quite a sizable number of those express seven-day ballots from overseas military voters are taking between, now don't get me wrong, a lot of them get there in seven days, but we had quite a sizable stack of them that took in some cases three weeks uh, from overseas locations. And I'm not talking about necessarily for deployed areas, I'm talking about just being slow coming through the postal system. With that tracking then, were you able to isolate where the glitch was? Because well, we have Scott, we've heard from other testimony that there were certain places where the ballots sat, the mailbags sat, for a week or two weeks as people were trying to track their ballots and then they were finally uh, returned. Well, and, and, and Scott took a, a number of, of those tracking codes with him so that um, he could find out. Uh, th there were some zip codes as a source zip code from the Military Postal Service that we were able to identify. Um, and I would imagine if we chase that down, there's not a big master list somewhere that anyone will share with me. Um, who those military postal offices are, and I suspect you'll find that they were on the front end of things and that it took their ballots, uh, like I said, in some cases uh, three weeks before it hit the mail processing uh, intake at uh, Mobile, Alabama. 
Miami-Dade County also had uh, a significant number of issues with uh, ballots being received and, and returned through the post office. But I want to make it very clear that we have an excellent uh, partnership and working relationship with this, the uh, post office. I and my staff have had several meetings with them. Um, they have committed to uh, personally handling our, our mail volume. Whenever we are in an election cycle, we send them reports, daily reports, on the volumes that will be coming to them so they can expedite them. So um, I'm just very confident that we will be able to work through this issue. And it was simply a matter of volume, sheer volume, that we were all dealing with. We have uh, Commissioner uh, Grayson, Commissioner Thomas, and Professors Persily in that order coming up here. And, excuse me, and Commissioner Mays, I apologize. So one uh, question that anybody could answer, uh, there was a reference to same day absentee voting on the, or election day absentee voting. Could, that sounds almost like a vote center, but only in your office. Could you ex explain, and, did, and so one, explain that, and two, is it still around after these legislative changes? During the 2012 election, there was a great emphasis to bring people to our offices to vote absentee ballots on the counter. Um, in fact, the three South Florida counties, Palm Beach, Broward, and Miami, were in fact sued, and the settlement was open your office on Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday to allow voters to come in and vote a ballot on the counter because we, we didn't have the adequate time okay. frame for early voting. Um, the legislature has discontinued election day vote on the counter ballots uh, with the exception of emergencies and the division of elections and the secretary is going to establish rules. Okay, great. And then one question just for, uh, for Mark. Did you run on this ISO uh, certification system or just quality in general the first time? And then I don't know if you've run for real. I'm just c curious whether voters, you thought voters cared about that other, or is it just generically like you're doing a good job kind of thing? The very first time I ran for office, I ran with no party affiliation and lost greatly. Um, but following that, I ran on the fact of, of where I came from and what I've done. And then following um, this last one election that I did um, was specifically pushing the ISO process and the individual that was uh, obviously opposed to that um, took, took great interest uh, specifically since it was a past individual in my office that did not uh, totally and encouragingly uh, embrace the process. They felt that doing a purchase request was so much out of the question. It was ridiculous that you would actually have to get permission and, and, a, and a dollar amount to spend before. Um, a lot of those guidelines and standards never were not in the office when I took it over at all. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay. Commissioner Mays. So just to follow up on the ISO topic that was just started, the tension between state, local, and national when you look at standards, how do you think standards should come about? Because ISO is not the only one. N no, it is not. TMI, Six Sigma. You got I mean, it. You can go on and on and on, but they have different levels of measurement. But some have annual audits, some do not. And I think that if you were to ask my staff when the annual audit is approaching, they're paying a lot more attention, they're evaluating in more detail, and they know that it's not political, it's performance-based, and we like that. So, but do you think it's something that the country needs to focus on in setting up standards, or it should be state by state, or supervisor by supervisor? I would never want to tell my supervisors who are elected what to do. But That's I okay. You can <laughs> just make a recommendation. <laughs> I would definitely recommend, I can tell you, again, I have a military background, and when I've got in an aircraft or I'm on the front line, I want to know I have quality. And if we're going to use ISO as standards in our government contracting before anyone can bid on a contract or purchase any equipment, I would want to say our precious right to vote is just as important as the life of a veteran. So, and this can be for anyone, but if you look at moving to technology, and I know technology has been peppered through all of the t throughout the entire testimony this morning, how adequately do you think your emergency preparedness 
has taken into account the potential failure, both malicious and otherwise, if you're moving to technology systems that are interconnected. Well, um, I would say that uh, the reality is that whatever the incident is, based on the timing of the incident, if you have an incident the day of an election, yep. uh, you are in a very difficult situation. But planning in advance, coordination of state, local, and federal governments in advance, knowing where your resources are, and having a clear lines of communication between local supervisors, emergency managers at the local level, and the state to be able to manage resources, whether it's generators or transportation plans, whatever, requires a systematic statewide effort uh, along with the federal government. But it all starts at the local level. Uh, and that coordination requires long-term planning, and if you haven't done it, uh, you need to do it, and you need to refresh it on a regular basis. While technology is out there, sometimes that technology can fail, and you need to have backups. That backups, backup requires communications, and without it, you will fail. Mr. Secretary, let me ask you this following <coughs> question. Do you think that while it makes absolute sense to look at all the innovation that's taking place, that this will end up putting greater budget pressure across the state as technology becomes obsolete or the performance of it doesn't measure up? Or do you think it'll be neutral? No, I think that there's always going to be uh, budget pressure because of the evolving nature of, of technology. And it's incumbent on me, uh, it's incumbent on supervisors to voice that to the appropriate parties that uh, fund elections, whether it's the state level or county commissions. But I often say whether it's discussing standards for supervisors whether it's election laws uh, or whether it's funding, that the basic function of administering elections is the most important thing. You can have the best standards, the best laws, the most money, but if you fail at the most fundamental parts of administering an election, you fail your voters in an election. And then just one last question, and this has to do, thank you for the ballot, Supervisor Townsley, that was very enlightening. So if you look at the state law that deals with the content of ballots, do you think it adequately addresses the comprehensibility of that ballot given our general population? And if I could jump in, it really truly, um, the, the comprehensibility was certainly partially to blame. The word limit, uh, quite <coughs> obviously from the stack of paper each of you were holding from Penny, um, kind of speaks for itself. Um, but even those of us with a, a single language jurisdiction, um, when we were going through our ballot proofing methodology, we're not certified like Mark, but we do a lot of the stuff Mark does. He's also my, also my mentor, which probably helps. Um, but when we were proofing our ballots, just reading them for diction and making sure that I had all the words in place, all the commas in the right place, just reading the ballot out loud took me and one of my staff members 28 minutes just to read the words and say them out loud. 28 minutes to read them out loud. So if you did not do any preparation, if you were a voter who the first time you saw that was when you hit the voting booth, I will guarantee you they were taking 45 minutes to an hour in the voting booth just getting through those 11 amendments. And the change that they put into our law only provides that 75 word maximum to the first ballot initiative that the legislature puts forward. So if that one gets rejected, the state of Florida legislature can issue one with as many words again as they would like to use. So only their first ballot summary that, that gets sent to the court has to be 75 words. Any subsequent ones, including the one that the law allows the um, state attorney to write, um, can exceed that 75 words by with no word limitation whatsoever. So we may find ourselves right back in that same boat. And I would make a comment on that. Um, I think for years, um, for years our voters have complained, and this is voters from all walks of life, they've complained about the difficulty in reading the constitutional amendments. And so I think with the entire spectrum of the election that we all observed and experienced this year, I think the, uh, the realization that we have to do something to make a ballot more uh, comprehensible for our voters is really gonna be important. And I don't 
I'm kind of going out on a limb, I guess, but I would not anticipate that we go back to this kind of a situation anytime soon because those of us who are on the front lines of the election, we saw our voters struggle. We saw our voters bring in someone for assistance or to come into a polling place and ask if there's anyone who could help them read the words, not interpret for them, but to actually read the language of those amendments. So I think, uh, I think we've all learned from this and in moving forward, I'm hopeful that we don't see ballots return, the amendment language return to what it has been, what, we, what it was in 2012. And anecdotally, I, um, I had personal experience in, in one of my um, early voting location of assisting a voter, and I spent 45 minutes assisting the voter in, in reading his ballot before I walked away from him. So, and I don't know how much longer he took, but he insisted on reading every single word and trying to contemplate the, the, the meaning of it all. Uh, Madam Commissioner, uh, I would argue, as I did before the legislature that this year, that if a petition limit on words is good enough for citizen petitions, that is good enough for legislative petitions. And number two, I would argue, um, I would argue that there's a responsibility that citizens have uh, that we try to implement as supervisors and as the secretary, that voters need to do their best to be prepared prior to going into a voting booth uh, to know what's on the ballot and who they're going to vote for. There certainly is enough media, there certainly are enough interest groups, not-for-profits, editorial boards, uh, and supervisors being available to educate voters with their get out the vote efforts, with their HAVA money, educate people about what's on the ballot. So voters need to likewise accept the responsibility to know in advance what they're voting for before they go into the voting place. And just a point, several of <coughs> us at the table here have counties where we do not allow municipalities to piggyback with us in the fall for the very purpose of helping to reduce the ballot. And maybe at the same time, as many of you come from states, maybe it wouldn't be bad to have elections every year. And in the odd year, we move the amendments off the candidate ballots. And uh, amendment ballots could be done by mail uh, uh, instead of polling place. And Commissioner, to your point about the costs, I, w I mentioned about the fact that we built our own uh, electronic poll books. When you take into consideration the amount of money I was spending to buy the paper, the printing time to print the books, bind them, deliver them to the polling place, then print the updates for changes from the time they were printed to all that. When you take the, all that cost and then the post-election reading the names for voter history verification, the cost savings in two elections paid for our books countywide. I think that um, the ballot questions were very extremely difficult this year in particular. There was a study written that indicated that there were numerous double negatives and the language was written at graduate school level. Unfortunately, not all of our voters picked up their sample ballots and totally read them before they came to the precinct or the early voting location to vote. We certainly handed out numerous copies of the amendments while they were standing in the hours long lines at early voting. However, in some instances, these citizens don't avail themselves to any kind of particular organizations or groups, and they really struggled to try and learn to, to know what these questions were. They were voting. Um, one gentleman stood in our voting booth for two hours in order to be able to try and comprehend, and I'm, I'm not really sure that he was successful, but he voted every question. Commissioner Thomas. Well, I certainly sympathize with you all. Um, I am amazed that your tabulators actually function, uh, <laughs> that putting that many ballots through, I, I really am. I'm shocked that you didn't have tabulators just dying all day long. Um, I guess it is a testament to, um, to those machines that they can actually make it through this volume. Um, I'm interested, uh, I, I'll throw out for anyone that talks during these questions, if you want to give me a definition of what a long line is, uh, I'd be glad to, uh, to hear that. Um, so I pick up that you have 
some sort of provisional ballot for people who have recently moved. And that brings me back to one of my, um, one of my issues, and that is the implementation of the motor voter. And I wonder how well your DMV here in Florida works in terms of getting address changes to, uh, for voter registration through the process to you on a timely basis so that on election day you're not doing provisional ballots. I'll start with that question. Well, part of that problem um, can relate to the voter interaction. And in my county, uh, my tax collector is now the one who's issuing driver's license. And so that's mm -hmm. being done as a function of the tax collector's overall uh, stuff. But um, the voter can change their address at DMV. But if they don't say change my address for voting purposes, we don't get the update. Right. Um, so as plugged in as our system is, the Florida Voter Registration System, which we um, expanded following our 2001 election reforms uh, in Florida and then following the Help America Vote Act, um, we built a really robust system. But again, it comes down to when that voter goes to change their address, it's not a force, it doesn't bounce against the voter registration rolls and see does it need to change their, their registration address. If the voter doesn't say, update my voter registration when they get down to that question on the screen, then we, then we never see the address. They're change. not prompting that or is that well, something? Well, they, they, they ask them if they need to register to vote and if they say, no, I'm already registered, they say, well, do we need to update this with them? And if they say no, because they either think they did it or maybe their wife took care of it or whatever, um, then the potential exists for us not to see it. Um, to answer your long line question, mm -hmm. um, I can't give you a solid number, but uh, looking at Mr. Britton down there, and I know what he does for a living, I can tell you that the length of the line you're standing in depends on what you're standing in the line for. Um, because I guarantee you that the newest ride at Disney World, no one will bat an eye to stand in that line for four hours to ride it. But if they come to my early voting site and have to wait more than 45 minutes, it's the line is too long. Interesting. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, so what's the largest precinct? I, I'm somewhat surprised that there's not a state cap on how large a, a polling place or a precinct can be in terms of the number of registered voters. And I do understand with your three separate distinct elections that you run, that you are playing an equation out as that plays forward and you got caught short this last time and that a number of people didn't do as much early voting obviously because of the system and moved back in on election day. But what's your largest precinct? I, I have a single precinct with almost 6,500 registered voters in it, but it because of its geography and I think Bill can probably speak way more about geographical problems than I can. Um, but because of the geography, there's really no place to split and make another. I mean, I could split it into more precincts, but I don't have any more polling locations in the geography. And so you just leave it alone. Um, but you staff it accordingly. So, I mean, sure. the poll workers who work there know, uh, number one, they get, you know, extra equipment. They get uh, more, we break the, the precinct register into smaller denominations so that you're serving more voters. You know, inevitably, everyone whose last name begins with W shows up at the same time. Right. Um, and so, you know, they, but, you know, that polling location can put 450 people an hour through. So I know that if everybody shows up, and they're not all going to because about half of them vote early or absentee, uh, that that precinct can handle it. When I, when I was doing redistricting and reprecincting this past year, we actually sat down and looked at a number you can really get your hands around. How many of these voters historically, 2008, 2010, 2006, 2004, how many of them are actually going to their polling place? And plus or minus about 50, I can tell you how many people are coming to my polling places on election day. And so uh, for, for me, we shrunk the number of polling locations. I kept the number of precincts. I just reassigned the voters to different polling locations. Um, and so I do have one that has almost 9,000 people assigned to it, but I know that only 3,000 of those people are coming to vote on election day, and we can handle that volume accordingly. And Chris, you referred to the fact that we do juggle three different type of elections, and a recently retired election administrator, Scott Doyle, gave us a legacy with vote centers. 
and uh, I co-chair a committee within our association where we're looking at what is the future of elections in the future and could we combine election day and early voting and go to vote centers in our state and then be back to vote centers and absentee voting as the two methods. Yeah, that yeah, makes a lot of sense. Yes, sir. Mr. Commissioner, I've given some thought to your question about the definition of a long line <laughs> since you asked earlier. And there's one thing for certain, that the voters will let you know what the definition of a long line is if you have a long line. And number two, I often tell and told legislators this year that if voters wait uh, till the last minute to vote, just like if you wait to buy your turkey before the day before Thanksgiving, you're going to wait in line. So we in Florida try to present voters with as many options, as Mr. Cowles has said, and many opportunities to vote, whether it's early or by absentee voting or voting on election day. And the responsibility of a voter to understand that if you wait till the end, you're likely to wait in line. It's incumbent on us to plan properly. I often say too, that voting and the elections administration is a little bit of science and a little bit of art. Every election is different, requires innovation, and it's important that we all work together to make sure that that, uh, that process works efficiently. Mr. Anderson, surely you have a definition, a standard of what a long line is. <laughs> I don't at this time, but I really like Paul Lux's um, definition of, of a standard. But no one wants anyone to wait in a line. And again, w we had one precinct where everyone showed up in the morning and the afternoon was totally open. I, when you can't control the volume of a faucet, how do you gauge and measure it? Um, and in Florida, we have three options, and that complicates it even more. I concur with Mr. Cowles. I, I definitely am for vote centers with more locations, but a, a set, firm direction for voters to know because the more opportunities you give voters, there's more opportunity for confusion. So. I'd I just like to think that the Disney Fast Pass is the way to go with voting. Yes. Give everybody an appointment slip and tell them when to come back. Um, I'd like to comment on the, on the line issue. I think when we look at people standing outside of a facility and they're in a line, our first reaction is that is a long line. But I think the line is impacted by the size of the facility, how many people and equipment and workers and booths you can actually get into a facility. Um, in, my, in my county, as an example, we go and visit each one of the locations where we're going to have early voting. We usually don't have lines on election day, but we actually take pen to paper and draw out that facility to see how much equipment. We know how much space a voter is going to take up once they get into that a location to start processing from one station to another. But there's a real reality about a line is that it's going to be, um, the length of the line is going to be determined by the number of people that you can actually get into the facility and go through the voting process. So since the, um, the options for early voting locations has been expanded, then uh, there's a potential that our li long lines would disappear if we're able to select those areas of greatest capacity. I also think there are some realities about voting, about elections that we all have to face. We talk about uh, the polling places, the precincts, the number of people that we're putting into a polling place. In many instances, we are lucky to be able to find a polling place right. that we can sustain over any period of time because we don't own facilities. Elections, uh, we're probably a very unusual group of people because we have a mandate to produce a perfect product and all of us certainly ascribe to that concept, but there are so many of the resources that we are required to depend upon that we have no control over. So if two days before an election, the uh, owner of a facility calls up and says, look, I just don't think you can come here. Uh, in two days. And so then you put on your best uh, mediation strategies to see if there's anything at all you can possibly do to be able to hold on to this location. So the more we cut our um, 
voter population up into small and smaller groups, the challenge of finding a location to be able to conduct an election becomes even greater. So I think line, line management, uh, facilities, they're all tied together. And uh, you know, some of us get to be very innovative because we have to. In locations where we can get people inside a building, Florida is hot. South Florida is extremely hot during the time that we have elections. We've been fortunate in some of our early voting locations to have facilities that have auditoriums where they will allow the voters to come in out of the weather, be seated, be entertained with movies or what have you until their numbers are called in this numbering system that we have. But um, all of us, I think, are challenged to meet the requirements that will go for it, that will contribute to a perfect election, but there are resources that we don't always have total control over. I think that's a great point, is that as you see when you talk about those resources, postal resources, it's not just the election officials and their staff that are running elections. There are a lot of folks that are involved in actually running elections in this country. And that's why we form the partnerships and try to engage individuals that we are depending on, but still there are a lot of variables that are just out there that need to be readjusted. Thank you. If I may make a comment, please. Um, there may be an assumption that uh, because of the long lines, uh, there was poor planning, uh, but I can tell you that my historical analysis told me that I was going to have a 30% election day turnout for the general election. I planned for 35% and above. We actually had 31%. I had long lines. So the issue was entirely not planning. Commissioner Co-Chair Ginsburg. Thank you, Bob. Thank you all very much for your, um, for your analysis and very candid answers about the, the problems of long lines. Um, I, I have a, a question sort of on the, the cures part of it. Um, you, you and, and there may be differences for early voting and for election day voting, but the, the question still applies. So all of you assess the reasons. They were reasons that were prevalent in or existed in every polling place. Yet um, in, your, in your own individual counties, there were not so many places that had long lines. Not every place did have long lines. I mean, in Broward, you had maybe five places out of 792 precincts. And this is according to media reports, so <laughs> feel free to correct this in any way, shape, manner, or form that need be. In Dade, there were 35 precincts, apparently, out of 829. In Orange, nine out of 227. And in Palm Beach, eight out of 842. So there were places that had the same issues with the length of ballots and planning was the same. Can you adopt any best practices from the places in your jurisdictions that did not have long lines where the phenomenon was not present in the places that did have the long lines? Take a shot at that. In um, some of my locations, uh, our check-in stations vary from two to six. In locations where I had six check-in stations, that meant I could get more people into the facility. So when I got more people into the facility, then the way they moved in and out of that sort of depended upon what their needs and their abilities were in terms of responding to the long ballot. But I think the square footage makes a huge, huge difference. And a long line may not exist in a location all day. But if that facility, and I'm going to go to Miramar, Miramar is one of my most southwestern locations, and the facility that we used was a small community room in a uh, library. Well, I think overall in Miramar, we probably voted 
oh, I don't know, 15, 1,600 people per day, maybe a little bit more than that. But then when does the person come? If the line starts in the morning with 200 people, then more than likely throughout that day, you're going to have somewhere around 200 people because we don't have the Disney Fast Pass. However, we have been in touch with Disney representatives who are talking us through some of the procedures that they find for line management efficiency. So uh, hopefully we'll be able to maintain that relationship. Us too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but I just think, say in the Miramar location, we started out with a, oh, a small room. It wasn't, I don't think it was 3,000 square feet far from it. And so when we're in this small room, the library is in operation. A library cannot close its doors for eight days or 14 days to its community. So we are relegated to a small area. So what we started to do was to see how we could modify that small space that we had, take over a portion of the lobby uh, to get some of the people inside out of Florida weather. So it's... Um, it's a very, it's a challenging situation and every location is different. And you can have a location that's huge. I had another location in Pompano. I could have put 20 check-in stations there if I had it. But then when my staff and I go to every early voting location every day, and so when you go to an early voting location and you see that there's a long line and we have the technology uh, that would let us know what wait times were at different locations, it's very difficult to get our voters to move from one location to another. If it's closer to their community, that's where they want to be. If they're with their neighbors down the street, that's where they want to be. If it's going to take them an hour, hour and a half based on our projections, they're willing to take the time to do that. So I don't want, I don't want the panel to go away thinking that they've got long lines, they go in the office, they close the door. We're managing those lines throughout the day. We're communicating, we're calling in to find out how many people are there. We're trying to manage uh, assistance for the disabled, move people. I even employed buses in one, um, election to bus voters from one location to another so that we can accommodate them faster. So when we say there are long lines at polling places in Florida, we are not oblivious to that. We are not in a situation where we're taking no action. We're continually trying to move those lines, just like Disney, where they have uh, all kinds of observation and their staff is out there. We're doing the same thing, except our resource load is a lot smaller. We found that the lack of technology was hindering our ability to move voters. And we too are an independent, we don't have the voter registration company that 62 other counties have. So what we're working on right now, and, and it will be complete by the end of August when we conduct an election, is off the shelf poll books that would provide us information. We could glean information as to how many voters have voted, um, what is the frequency that they're checking in, and it's going to provide us an updated informational piece that we have lacked. Um, in the past, I think you heard Supervisor Cowles indicate that in the, the current electronic poll books that are used, if, if they're used in 62 counties, are associated with the voter registration company, and they do not allow implementation of any new devices. Um, the new device is an off-the-shelf mini iPad. It holds in your hand. There's a QR code on your driver's license. You take a picture. It populates your information instantly. You sign the mini iPad. It pops us voter history, and we know instantly how many people are moving through. We can even tell what the battery power is of that iPad all day long. I think that we need to move forward with some inexpensive off-the-shelf technology and some innovation that we have uh, mostly with the independent offices. Um, there's 67 counties. There's 
62 on this other system. But I think that, that it's doable. I think that we can move our voters through, not only at the precinct locations, but at early voting locations much quicker. It will be a challenge to go land a convention center for 14 days and a fairgrounds for 14 days, but they are large facilities. Our experience in going out to monitor all of our early voting locations before we started was that we could reasonably fit two ballot printers in each of those locations without totally blowing the breakers in a whole city hall or a library. If we are able to secure, and we're hopeful, uh, our convention center or our fairground for 14 days and have larger stations for early voting and have more technology that moves them quickly that's inexpensive, I think we can get it. You hear the word voter over and over and over. The one thing that we're all doing that we're trying to accomplish is to be ready for the voter. And I think what's important is to encourage that voter to be ready for us. If they come in and their address is not current they ha or they're not registered or something else of that nature, I can say in the last election that I did 15 second spots prior to the election out of ways encouraging just get your address updated, get your address updated, get your address updated. That simple fact right there helped us. So again, it, it's the simple things sometimes that encourage because that also ties in to the poll books. I can tell you that I would, my county commission is not excited about the thought of spending $300,000 for poll books in our county. And as far as justifying the audit side, we can do that manually, cheaper and more cost effective. However, in the high, high volume counties, they simply couldn't perform what we do at a smaller county in the volume that they have. So um, we all, I'm sure every, every single county in the state of Florida would love to have that possibility of poll books. But again, it ties back to budget and the word uniformity. And, and that might be something that the state needs to look at and say, at least at a minimum, everyone will have a poll book so we can have a standard there. Okay, thank you. We have one last, I think, set of questions. I thought I'm missing somebody down the line. Oh, excuse me. Uh, Commissioner Escobar, did you want to ask, ask a question? Yeah, just one question. Yes, please. Go ahead. And Commissioner Britton, did you want to reply to the entreaties that you've been hearing all morning long? <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Yeah, I, would, I, I do have to say something, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wish, I wish that all of our guests uh, were happy to stand in line. Um, <laughs> so that isn't the case all the time. Uh, however, I appreciate uh, the accolades that you're, that you're giving here. One of the things that I'm struck by is uh, in all of your testimonies, there are a myriad of wonderful initiatives um, and projects that you've all put in place. Um, in listening to all that, what I have been grappling with was how do I understand how you're doing, right? There's lots of great things happening, but at the end of the day, I, I'm not sure I understand what the key metrics are, uh, whether there's a scorecard um, that we all can kind of agree to and talk the same language around. So I'm just wondering, does that exist? Is it, or is it different for everybody? Or maybe it's an area of opportunity. Well, it, 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 it's really hard to, on something that can be so amorphous from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, I mean, how do you compare uh, Miami-Dade County with, what is it, 1.3 million voters? With, uh, let's say, Liberty County, who has 4,000 voters. Um, in Liberty County, at the rate my county was putting voters through early voting, an average of 350 per hour across my four early voting locations, I could have voted the entire population of Liberty and Lafayette County five times over. Um, so do they need the same number of early voting hours as Miami? Absolutely not. Um, in those jurisdictions who have never been open the Sunday before election day, do they need to be forced to be open when no one is coming? And that answer is no. That's why the flexibility was built in. So of course, once you build in flexibility, now how do you measure? And that becomes part of the problem with that. Um, we. I know your commission is charged with looking at a lot of best practices and understand too that our best practices are not limited to our conferences. We have two a year. We have breakout sessions for staff who are 
and those sessions are subject specific so that people can, can learn and talk to people who are doing the same things that they are doing. But we also have the mentoring program that I mentioned where every supervisor who's new is assigned uh, a supervisor of, you know, to talk to. Uh, when Dr. Snipes was first, I was at that meeting, when Dr. Snipes was first appointed and it was very close to the election, if you want to talk about someone who had the look of terror in her eyes, uh, and rightly so, <laughs> and rightly so, but, uh, you know, we put her in a room with 12 supervisors, Bill Cowles and a number of others who said, we are here for you. You tell us what you need to help us make your elections a success. Um, we also, most of us on one level or another, participate in other national organizations like IACRI out or the Election Center. We even developed our own um, program internally for continuing education for supervisors and staff also for sharing best practices. So you can share a lot of best practices, but some of it's not scalable. And then the, the, the challenge, and I'm not sure ISO is the way to do it either, um, the, the challenge of how you measure success is, was your name and face on CNN uh, sometimes? Um, and that's not even always true. Commissioner Echevarria, please. Yeah, and I, and I totally endorse the, the question that Commissioner Britton asked. It, it did strike me that it wasn't clear to me what the definition of success was as I listened to all the different, I, I heard what some of the issues were, but the definition of what success is, and I, and I understand the complexity as you identify, um, but, but our task is to deal with the administration of election to make sure that we improve, that there are no undue delays, that's the specific mission, and that the experience is improved seems to me the one thing I was curious about was what is the definition of success? And success at a macro level in Florida should be the same. How you get there can be different. But the definition of success for a voter in Florida, to me, strikes me it should be the same. Um, so that would, would follow up on that question. And just to make sure I got my math right, is it, and this might be for the secretary who would be the best scorekeeper of, of the entire state, but 67 counties, is that right? And so, if my math was right listening, less than 5% of the two supervisors at the end in Dade and Broward make up 25% of the voters. Is that right? If I go one county up to Palm Beach, you can tell I've been in Florida, right? You go up one county to Palm Beach, you pick up another 10%, so maybe you're at 35. So 35% of the voters that we're trying to improve the experience on reside in three counties in this state. So I'm gonna therefore direct my question towards the end of the table here for, for both supervisors. Um, I was curious, um, Supervisor Penny, you, Tomsley, you did indicate that the predictive analysis said 30%. You planned for 35. Turnout was 31. So clearly that calculation of predictive analysis worked. Um, so when I looked at your primary contributors that identified, what, what predictors didn't work then? Because you predicted the total turnout very accurately and were very conservative in your approach, obviously. And I applaud you for that. But somewhere at the next level of predictive analysis, something didn't work to your to the collective satisfaction, which is why y'all had a commission. So I was curious, what didn't predict well? Well, I I, I think that um, where the assumptions failed us is the something that was very difficult to predict, and that was um, the the timing or point in, in which voters decide to vote. Um, you know, we had votes, voters that uh, they converged, if you will, upon their, their early voting sites and their polling places at um, seemingly the same time. They, and and, and I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of our voters because they were very passionate about this election and they chose to stay. And in spite of all the, the negative press, they made, for the most part, they made their stay enjoyable. They, they did. But I, I think it was just, this. the whole election was totally unpredictable. And I think that the best planning that any of us could, could have done would not have avoided the, the conversion of all of those factors that came together and, 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 and created the challenges that we face. Can I just say one follow-up, Ms. Yeah. And I can validate that this was in fact the ballot, not the exact ballot, but it looks like the ballot I filled out. And it did take me quite a long time, probably because I don't have a graduate degree, I just have a four-year degree, probably would have been helpful. Um, to just a question out of curiosity, 
how how long before the day of the election would 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 you and your team know that this was the ballot and this would be the size of the ballot? I think it was, uh, my recollection serves me. I think we, we knew that there was a great potential that we would have a four or five page ballots at least six months or more be before. Thank you. And, and if I could just talk a little bit too about, about some of the metric as far as throughput for the voters are concerned too because uh, my, in my voters experience where they only had two cards um, depending on how the early voting equipment handles it or depending on how the po election day equipment handles those ballots um, it, it almost doesn't matter how many tabulators penny put into a location if your average voter is is instead of the norm with a three or four page ballot where the average voter might take maybe a minute to insert their ballot um, now you have every voter taking five to seven minutes to insert their ballot and that and that's a factor of did they did they even vote all of the cards uh, when that ballot is rejected and now do I have to get a poll worker to come over to override the ballot rejection and so when you take a process because of that length of the ballot that the technology um, that is put in place to help protect the voter let's make sure that it's rejecting overvoted ballots and undervoted ballots so that those voters have an opportunity to correct their mistakes that came to us through HAVA. Most of us were already doing that anyway. Um, but that metric um, also filters into this how long does it take an average voter to get through that process. And even if you plan for that, um, the unpredictability of do all the voters leave it blank and does that take longer? Does that take more poll workers? Does that take poll workers away from other tasks? Um, all of those metrics together make the process much more complicated and much harder to predict, um, even when you have the best planning in place. Let me again thank the, the commission members for coming to Miami-Dade and to Florida to listen to us, to learn from us, and take away uh, what our most important experiences were this year and how important voters' activities are. But also let me suggest that part of this dynamic of voter turnout uh, goes to not-for-profit organizations to get out the vote groups, to parties, and to campaigns. Um, and I strongly suggest that as part of your testimony as you travel around that you talk to uh, turnout experts so that you can understand how this variable about how people are going to behave affect how administrators act in their pre-planning and in their daily execution. I think that's most important because I can tell you observations late in the game or late in the elections process, there were clearly indications that groups or parties or individuals or campaigns affected turnout. Where the people were going to turn out, how they were going to turn out, whether they were going to vote early or absentee. And I think without that examination, um, I don't think that your analysis would be complete. So I strongly urge you to do that. Thank you very much. And I think that our, the last question I think we have is from Professor Persley. Thanks. Uh, on that point, one of the, and we're going to hear from two turnout experts later today, but, th but one of the things that hampers our efforts is to try and get a sense of the resources that are available to individual um, polling places. So I was wondering if, if you have this data at the statewide level, uh, we'd be eager to get it. Those of you who have it at the local level, I that would be great as well. Um, what Broward County did with wait times is uh, incredibly valuable uh, for studying the problem. If there are others in the state that have uh, published or, or you, if you have wait times by polling place, that would obviously be invaluable information. For those that don't, don't have that, if you could provide the commission the, um, the polling places that you agree were uh, the ones where long wait times were, uh, just so that we don't only rely on media reports or, or what's the publicly available data, that would be useful. And then in predicting what those wait times would be, if you know uh, and have readily available the number of poll workers per polling place, um, the number of poll, work, uh, poll books, and the number of voting machines, um, then we can begin to try and unpack what the model would be for uh, predicting wait times in some of these areas. I've also been asked um, from one of our military voting experts to ask for those, I for those of you, uh, well, 
if you have it at the statewide level, obviously this would be best, but, but maybe for Mr. Lux, uh, you can help with this, which is whether you can separate out the, the overseas military versus the uh, domestic military, and, and if we could get a sense of what the county totals were for both domestic and overseas military, that would be most useful. Yeah. Um, ju just to let you know that, that the numbers we can give you are going to be um, inaccurate to the point that uh, you heard me say in my opening remarks, we're home to the uh, to uh, the Army 7th Special Forces Group. Um, people to whom we mail ballots in county, sometimes we get those ballots back from overseas. So where does that voter count? Uh, when I mailed the ballot, they were a stateside voter. When I got the ballot back, they were now an overseas voter. Mm -hmm. um, so any number I can give you, um, the Air Force Special Operations Command is also at Hurlburt Field, so I have a lot of people who are coming and going quite quickly um, and with very short notice, and it is not an uncommon occurrence in my jurisdiction, and I can't speak for everybody's, um, that the number of people that I said I had the, who were stateside UACAVAs versus overseas UACAVAs is a highly fluid number, uh, literally day by day and, and election by election. So I'd be happy to provide you with the best information I have, uh, but understand that that might not be a completely accurate picture. Well, I, I think uh, on behalf of the commission, um, I, the co-chairs want to thank you all very much for a very long morning. You got here at 9. We ran you to 12.15, so having talked about long waits here, uh, <laughs> the, you have, you've exhibited enormous patience and endured a wait, but it's been extremely illuminating for us. and. Um, ben, do you have any further comments? No, just thank you. Thank you all very much for your comments and, and uh, your patience with us as well. Thank you. Thank you. We look forward to continuing the discussion.